I noticed some interesting things. First of all, um, Colombia had serious COVID mandates and travel restrictions, which it has recently lifted. I was, which was why we weren't going to go originally. Yeah, right? I mm -hmm. was required to have a negative COVID test within, I think, 24 hours of travel to get into the country, and they did ask me for it, so that is still there. But there was no other restriction. But I noticed the following interesting pattern. I saw far more people wearing masks than I would say is true anywhere in the United States that I've been really? uh, in the last six months. Hmm. Um, which, if you were to compare between American states, I would say that masks were a really good proxy for how crazy people were over COVID narrative, right? At this, this point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was absolutely not the case in Colombia. In fact, the pattern was random, as far as I could tell. You would frequently see people walking down the street, talking, enjoying life, and one was wearing a mask and the other wasn't wearing a mask. They're outdoors. And I, I began to puzzle over this because, you know, it's such a, you know, uh, a flashpoint in our culture, you know, whether you are or aren't on board with whatever the narrative is, that, you know, it's really, it's, it's wrecking relationships. And there was no sign of that here. So the question is really, why, if there's no sign of that, if people don't, you know, if one person who believes in the masks isn't feeling the need to implore their friend, oh, you should wear it too because you might get COVID and it'll be this, that, and the other, what is going on? Was it always so? I mean, I have I have seen pairs of people walking down the street in you know west west of the mountains on the west coast, uh, in which one is masked and one is not. Uh, I think every time the woman is masked and the man is not, when when it is a couple like that, uh, is is that a pattern that you noticed? Uh, I would say it was more women than men, but. It was there was really very little signal that I could find. Maybe there was signal and I just didn't figure it out. But mm -hmm. anyway, I also noticed some other things um, that I think are connected. And I'll tell you what I put together, which I did run by um, my host, and he he I think thought it was credible. But the doctor what, who put together the conference, who yeah. I don't I don't know if we asked him if we could mention him. Oh, I, I yeah. feel confident we can uh, at least just say uh, Doctor Ben. Um, mm -hmm. So. Well, the other thing I noticed was that Colombians were very much going on about their lives. There was much less of a sense of COVID trauma having disturbed normal patterns. This looked like Latin Americans doing what Latin Americans do, right? I was there over a weekend in Bogota. Mm -hmm. People were uh, dancing not only were they dancing in places where dancing was the thing, but, you know, couples would get up and they were dancing in a cafe because the song that was playing delighted them or whatever. Mm. So people were falling in love. They were holding hands. They were dancing. They were singing. They were, there was a great, uh, I, uh, I had to work a little bit to find an authentic food place and I was uh, getting dinner there in the place next Because you were door. staying in like conference land. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. I was in conference land. Yeah. So it was a long walk to anywhere, but... Um, but there was a great, really good band playing a lot of... This is at the Colombian Steakhouse that you found. Yeah. Uh -huh. they, they, were, they were next door and they were playing lots of uh, Latin rock songs that I didn't recognize, but that were compelling, and then occasional covers of songs that I, you know, both know and like. I can't name off the top of my head what the Colombian... Music. Oh, we got a cat with something in his mouth here. If uh, if that is worth dealing with, um, we're doing a little predation oh, interlude uh, here. Yeah. Um, uh, so you know, I'm just thinking. Okay, I can. You know, there there are there are known musical traditions in I assume every Latin American country, and I don't off the top of my head know. Uh, uh, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know for sure. I'm wondering if cumbia is okay. uh, yeah, is actually I the the. Colombian but I guess I'm. Variant. I didn't mean to put you on the spot at all. I was wondering if you felt like you were hearing something that was Colombian specific, or if it was sort of you know Latin American rock. It was young, modern, sophisticated rock, and the things that they chose to cover 
reflected the same thing. So like, you know, Radiohead, that's not the average <laughs> band you hear covered. Yeah. Um, but it, here it was. Um, so anyway, life looked surprisingly normal. The masks were completely at odds with that interpretation. And what I concluded was Colombians have lived um, under various kinds of tyranny, lots of it driven by American drug policy. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so they've lived under basically a regime in which they lack control at the large scale. And so what I concluded was mm. that what I was watching was people who had learned to sort of send whatever signal you need to send to authority so that it leaves you alone enough that you can live in the interstitial space and that's your life. And if, you know, if, if decades at a time are going to be lived under a tyrannical regime, you have to figure out how to do the stuff of life under its nose without getting its attention. Yeah, this is actually consistent with um, the next new piece of art that we have coming out that's going to be on merchandise that we're working with our amazing artist on right now, uh, which emerges from a line that you gave, I think, at the end of the last live stream, or maybe it was two live streams ago, which is lie to a tyrant. Yeah. Right? It's like, you know, what? It, do what you have to do uh, to, you know, to be real and honest. And uh, in what it sounds like what you're saying, even though there's not a particular tyrant uh, here that you're referring to with regard to Colombia, uh, like, you know, give the little nod to the authorities and then get on with your life. And then get on with your life, mm -hmm. you know, like in between places that it's watching, mm -hmm. right? So anyway, I thought this was great. This sort of, um, A, sort of reminded me both the fact of Colombia having gone from a place that was totally unsafe to a place that is now safe enough that at least I didn't feel threatened walking around. Yeah. Um, that is heartening, right? They've gone from a regime that was completely intolerable, you know, at the height of the drug war and uh, the the FARC revolution mm -hmm. um, to a state that is totally recognizable. And, you know, I mean, let's put it this way. Um, life there is crazy and the people there are crazy, but they're not as crazy as we are, right? We're all crazy. All people, all these cultures have their own idiosyncrasies and their own... So what's own... the, what's, I, I guess I didn't expect you to say that. What's the crazy that you think you do see? Well, I mean, first of all, uh, this, this, is a, this is another topic we're talking about. There is a way in which in Latin America, you and I have seen this so many different ways. Life is unfortunately cheap and it's very disturbing to see it, right? Mm -hmm. The the uh, exhaust that comes out of a truck that you can't get out from behind mm. is absolutely toxic. Yeah. And it's not and even, no regulations. nobody's even notices it. It's so ubiquitous that it's just like, well, what would I even do to notice that some toxin is being spewed into the car I'm traveling in, right? Mm -hmm. um, people, interestingly, people, huge percentage of the population on the roads is on motorcycles, mm. right? It, a lot of people aren't wearing helmets. People are, you know, women with their, you know, seven-year-old kid on the motorcycle going to school, right? All sorts of stuff that would jar you if you saw it here mm -hmm. um, is commonplace. I saw one very funny instance. Um, we were out in the in the backcountry, really quite remote, and a child on a motorcycle, he must have been 12 years old at most, mm -hmm. on a full-size adult motorcycle. Just him? Just him. Mm -hmm. uh, bear, he, he had no shirt on, as I recall it, certainly no helmet, right? Nothing like protective gear, right? He's on this bumpy road. Dirt road. Yep. He's got two pieces of rough-hewn lumber from, obviously, the local mill. Like tied. dimensional lumber, but rough-hewn. Really rough. Long, you know, long the, the kind of boards you would see, you know, used to... Siding? To, yeah, siding, okay. make a roof, something. Um, but anyway, he had the front of these boards, which were probably eight feet long, ten feet long, tied to the back of the motorcycle, and the back was dragging <laughs> on the ground, and he was just motoring by... Yeah. I mean, it was charming. He definitely solved the problem of how you're going to get the lumber home. But, um, you know, there was a way in which there was so much 
And also, I, I have to say, I just can't even solve this puzzle. Somehow, these back roads in Colombia, there is always exactly enough room for whatever two vehicles have just met to pass. There's like, you know, three or four centimeters beyond that. But it doesn't matter, right? It could be two cars. It's three or four centimeters. And it you're up be... in the Andes. Are you sometimes there's like a precipitous drop on one side or were you not? in? Oh, yeah, situation? there was all kinds. Of, well, I mean, at the very least, there are gullies where if you were, yeah. you know, uh, a few centimeters too far, you might end up sliding over and being stuck there all night. But sliding over and stuck is different from falling yeah, into the from abyss. Yeah, from falling into the abyss. Right. Yes. No, it's definitely preferable. I think so. Without being all the way at good, you know. But, okay, so there's a way in which... Um, Life is cheap in a way that is familiar from the developing world. But what really struck me was that I was now that familiar. There's nothing I can do about the danger, so I'm just not going to let it rule my life thing that happens in the developing world. Mm. I am now detecting that in the so-called first world, life has become very, very cheap. Oh, how? Um, well, I mean, if you think about all the things that have taken place during COVID, um, the fact that You've got, you know, huge numbers of adverse events. The press isn't very interested in figuring out what they are. You know, we're kind of not doing autopsies unless we absolutely have to. There's a way in which, um, you know, we're normalizing absurdly tragic deaths, right? Mm -hmm. Very young people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, young people. Strikes yeah, happen. Sudden adult death syndrome <laughs> strikes again. Yep. Um, and so anyway, there's always, you know, that jarring comparison between your culture and really any other yeah. culture. I mean, it even exists with the tiny little distinctions between us and Canada. Mm -hmm. And the bigger the gap between your culture and somebody else's, the more profound the comparison is. But these comparisons now are revealing things. A, we're more traumatized than the Colombians by what we've just been through, mm -hmm. right? It, maybe they were toughened up by what they went through in the period before. Well, it sounds like, I actually, I actually don't know, but I know like we were also told that we must accept m more stupid things. So they were told to mask and they were uh, at least vaccine mandates for visitors. But, uh, and I don't know specifically about this, so it's possible I'm wrong here, but I know that in many of the Latin American countries, Ecuador, Mexico, uh, Costa Rica, I believe, and I and I think this is pretty much across the board, that early treatment was available over the counter f f from the beginning. Basically, that there was no attempt. And I remember, like the the head of state in El Salvador was busy talking about vitamin D early on too. Yeah. But you know the the drugs that you know we shall never mention by name for fear that we somehow become re demonetized, even though we were still demonetized. Um, were just available and people were using them and they were even in um, they were even being given out by governments in Mexico um, as you know understood to be um, early treatment and in some cases prophylaxis packs yeah uh, so you know that you know it's possible that some Latin American country didn't do that um, but I don't know that to be the case and so um, even if you know many people are still masked, and we know there would have been uh, vaccine requirements uh, until recently, at least for visitors, uh, that doesn't mean that the degree to which basically the gaslighting of the populace was happening at the same level that it was in the United States and Canada and the UK and Australia and New Zealand. Basically, the English-speaking countries of the Western world had such an extraordinary degree of gaslighting such an extraordinary dis degree of like, well, if you're trying to figure out what's going on, you must be guilty of mis, dis, and malinformation, so we're going to shut you down. And it just went, it just went counter to everything. Uh, and, and I think, to your point, and that was such a switch from what we had come to expect, whereas the Colombians, having been effectively held hostage by not a government, but uh, a, a set of organizations that were outside of the government uh, for so many years came to figure out how to uh, sort of pretend to pay allegiance and then go on with their lives. Yeah, I, I think this is quite the case that effectively under tyranny, I think I believe this, under tyranny one is always gaslit. Mm -hmm. And 
if you have had enough of that in your history so that you've kind of gotten used to the idea that certain channels are compromised and they'll say stuff to you and it may even govern what you have to do, but privately you don't have to believe it, mm -hmm. right? That that gives you a kind of immunity. And what happened in, in the United States, at least, was that people were used to these channels being noisy but they were not anywhere near prepared for the order of magnitude of bullshit that flowed through them. And so, you know, I mean, it, this really is what the big lie means, right? The yeah. big lie is that the lie is so big that you can't imagine it's a lie because it just, it's beyond uh, what would credibly be misrepresented.